Imagine stepping into a world where the colossal woolly mammoth roams the Arctic tundra once again. A world where the past and the present intertwine. Today, we're exploring the ambitious endeavor to bring back the woolly mammoth that will be happening in 2027, a project that is much more than a scientific spectacle. It's a venture that opens a window into the fascinating life of these prehistoric giants, delves into the cutting-edge science of de-extinction, and poses profound questions about what other ancient creatures will science bring back. Will we see a Jurassic Park-style zoo in our lifetime? Reality to this is closer than you think. The year 2027 marks a pivotal moment in a biotech company's bold initiative to resurrect the woolly mammoth, an endeavor that intertwines the threads of advanced genetics, climate change, mitigation, and ecological restoration. This project transcends the realms of science fiction and academic curiosity, aiming to reintroduce these prehistoric giants into the Arctic tundra. The core idea is deeply rooted in ecological conservation, with the mammoth revival seen as a potential key to reinstating the disrupted balance of the Arctic ecosystem. Woolly mammoths, the colossal creatures that wandered across the Earth until their extinction around 4,000 years ago, played a significant role in their habitats. Their activities, such as uprooting trees and trampling snow, helped maintain vast stretches of Arctic grasslands. These grasslands, in turn, played a crucial role in preserving permafrost and maintaining the region's cold temperatures. The company's plan involves a cutting-edge process called gene editing, where specific genes from the woolly mammoth are inserted into the genome of its closest living relative, the Asian elephant. The goal is to engineer an elephant-mammoth hybrid that exhibits key mammoth traits such as long, shaggy hair, thick layers of fat, and blood adapted to cold temperatures. These traits are not just for superficial resemblance, they are crucial for the animal's survival in the harsh Arctic climate. The woolly mammoth, a prehistoric behemoth, once roamed the vast icy landscapes of the Earth during the late Pleistocene epoch, leaving a legacy that fascinates scientists and laypeople alike. This magnificent creature was superbly adapted to survive in the harsh climates of the Ice Age. One of the most defining characteristics of the woolly mammoth was its size. Adult males could reach heights of up to four meters at the shoulder and weigh as much as six to eight tons, making them one of the largest mammals to have walked the Earth. Their colossal tusks, which could grow over three meters long, were not just for show. They were used for a variety of purposes, including fighting, foraging under deep snow for vegetation and manipulating objects in their environment. The mammoth's most iconic feature, however, was its thick, shaggy coat of hair. This coat consisted of a dense underfur topped with long, coarse guard hairs, providing the insulation needed to survive the extreme cold. Beneath its woolly exterior, the mammoth had a layer of fat up to 10 centimeters thick, which acted as an additional shield against the cold. Another fascinating aspect of the woolly mammoth was its teeth. Unlike modern elephants, mammoths had a high-crowned tooth with numerous ridges. Perfect for grinding tough tundra grasses and other vegetation, these teeth were replaced six times during a mammoth's life, with the final set having to last for the rest of its lifespan. Mammoths were social animals, believed to live in matriarchal herds, much like modern elephants. Herds were likely led by an experienced female and comprised other females and their young, while adult males may have lived solitary lives or in smaller bachelor groups. Their extinction around 4,000 years ago remains a subject of study and debate among scientists. While it is widely accepted that a combination of climate change and overhunting by humans played a significant role, the science of de-extinction, particularly as it applies to the woolly mammoth, stands at the cutting edge of genetic technology. At its core, de-extinction involves reviving extinct species. This technology allows scientists to make precise targeted changes to the DNA of living organisms. In the context of the woolly mammoth, scientists are using CRISPR to edit the genes of its closest living relative, the Asian elephant, by inserting mammoth genes responsible for adaptations to cold environments. The process starts with mapping the woolly mammoth's genome, pieced together from well-preserved DNA found in mammoth remains extracted from the permafrost. Researchers identify key genes responsible for the mammoth's distinctive traits, 
These genes are then artificially synthesized and inserted into the genome of an Asian elephant in a way that they replace the elephant's original genes. The modified DNA is then used to create an embryo. However, rather than using a living elephant as a surrogate to gestate the embryo, scientists plan to develop the embryo in an artificial womb. This approach circumvents numerous ethical and logistical challenges. Despite the sophistication of the technology, the de-extinction of the woolly mammoth is fraught with challenges. The process is not just about splicing genes, but ensuring that the resulting creature can survive and thrive in modern ecosystems. There are questions about the animal's health, longevity and ability to adapt, as well as broader ecological considerations. For instance, would these creatures be vulnerable to modern diseases and how would they interact with existing species and ecosystems? The reintroduction of the woolly mammoth to the modern ecosystem is anticipated to be more than a mere scientific marvel. It's expected to play a pivotal role in ecological restoration. In the Pleistocene era, woolly mammoths were not just inhabitants of their environment, but active participants in shaping it. These enormous creatures, often referred to as ecosystem engineers, significantly influenced the landscapes they roamed. One of the mammoth's primary ecological roles involved the maintenance of vast grasslands in the Arctic region known as the Mammoth Steppe. By grazing, they kept the grasslands free of encroaching trees and shrubs, promoting a rich and diverse ecosystem. The mammoth's ability to clear dead vegetation and uproot trees was essential in fostering grassland expansion. Moreover, mammoths played a significant role in nutrient cycling. As they moved and foraged, they dispersed seeds and nutrients through their dung, facilitating plant growth and distribution. This nutrient dispersal helped maintain the health and diversity of the grasslands. In terms of their impact on the soil, mammoths helped aerate it with their tusks and feet, improving soil quality and promoting plant growth. In the modern context, the hypothesis is that reintroducing mammoths or mammoth-like hybrids could help restore the Arctic grasslands, which have diminished considerably since the Pleistocene. These animals could potentially help turn tundra back into grasslands. This transformation is significant because grasslands can store more carbon than forests in colder climates, thus potentially reducing the effects of climate change. This process could not only help preserve these environments, but could also serve as a natural and sustainable way to mitigate some impacts of climate change. The ambitious project to resurrect the woolly mammoth is just the tip of the iceberg in the burgeoning field of de-extinction. However, beyond the technical challenges, these initiatives raise important ecological, ethical and philosophical questions. Scientists must consider how reintroduced species would fit into modern ecosystems that have evolved in their absence and how they would interact with existing species. There are also concerns about the welfare of the resurrected animals and the potential unintended consequences of reintroducing species into the wild. Furthermore, the field of de-extinction prompts a broader discussion about conservation priorities and the allocation of resources. Some argue that the focus should be on protecting endangered species and preserving habitats rather than resurrecting extinct ones. Others see de-extinction as an innovative way to rejuvenate ecosystems and a powerful tool for raising awareness about biodiversity loss. Imagine zipping back in time to when dinosaurs were nowhere in sight, way back to the Precambrian era. We're talking about a whopping stretch from 4.6 billion years ago to around 541 million years ago. Picture Earth at this time. It's not the familiar blue and green globe we're used to. Instead, it's this young, fiery ball, more like a molten rock blazing through space, slowly cooling down to form its very first crust. Now, the atmosphere back then was nothing like today. Think of a mix of methane, ammonia, and all sorts of volcanic gases, not exactly the kind of air you'd want to breathe in. It was like something out of a sci-fi movie with skies painted in strange hues from non-stop volcanic eruptions and a constant shower of meteorites. But here's where it gets really interesting. In this seemingly hostile world, life started to appear. We're not talking about complex life forms, but these tiny, tough, single-celled organisms they were like the trailblazers in a place that was anything but welcoming. How and where life started is a big question mark. Was it near those deep sea vents in small warm ponds or did it hitch a ride from outer space? 
the possibilities are endless and totally fascinating. Now get this, Earth wasn't all solid and firm. For much of the Precambrian, it was more like a giant water world, a vast global ocean with a sprinkling of volcanic islands here and there. The continents as we know them were slowly taking shape. The tectonic plates beneath were just getting started, gearing up for the grand dance of continents. Amidst this aquatic world, the earliest life forms known as prokaryotes began to emerge. They were the unsung heroes, starting off the process of photosynthesis in its most basic form. Bit by bit, they began to change the atmosphere, setting the stage for an oxygen-rich air that we'd later see. Let's hit the fast-forward button and zoom to about 1.1 billion years ago. This is when Earth did something pretty wild. It pulled all its land together into one huge supercontinent called Rodinia. Imagine this, a massive stretch of land from one pole to the other, like Earth wearing a giant land belt. Now, Rodinia wasn't just a big chunk of land sitting there looking pretty. It shook things up big time. When all this land came together, it stirred the pot on a global scale, changing how the ocean moved, messing with the weather, and even tweaking the ocean's chemistry. The world was a very different place when Rodinia was around. Here's a brain bender. Some scientists think Rodinia might have been the culprit behind the snowball Earth events. The idea is that with Rodinia hogging all the land, Earth's natural heat blanket got all out of whack, leading to a massive deep freeze. We're talking about glaciers and ice covering pretty much everything, even places where you'd now go to catch some sun. It's like the whole planet turned into a giant snowball for millions of years. But life has a way of hanging in there. During these super chilly times, life might have found cozy spots near underwater volcanoes or in places where the ice didn't reach. It's like life always finds a little nook or cranny to survive. And these tough conditions, they might have been just the push life needed to get creative and evolve. The plot twist with Rodinia is that it didn't stick around forever. About 750 million years ago, it started breaking up, kind of like a band going their separate ways. This breakup was a big deal. It didn't just create new oceans and continents. It might have helped the Earth thaw out from its snowball state. The breakup changed how the oceans moved and how the air circulated, possibly warming things up again. Let's zoom into a really cool part of Earth's history, the Proterozoic Eon, right at the tail end of the Precambrian era. This period is like the blockbuster moment in the story of life on Earth. We're talking about a huge leap from those tiny single-celled creatures to life that's a bit more complex and, let's face it, more interesting. Picture a world where, for billions of years, it's just these single-celled organisms, kind of like the Earth's solo artists. Then, around 1.8 billion years ago, bam, these cells start teaming up, creating groups and then full-on complex organisms. It's as if they suddenly realized there's strength in numbers. This change was huge, it's like going from a solo singer to a full orchestra. It paved the way for all sorts of larger and more diverse forms of life, and really shook up the natural world. Now, the fossil records from this time are like a treasure trove. Take the Ediacaran biota, for example. These guys show up in the fossil record around 600 million years ago, and they're just weird and wonderful. We're talking about fossils that look like discs, fronds, maybe a weird pillow. Things that would make you do a double take. They were some of the first complex creatures to swim around in Earth's oceans. But the million dollar question is, why did life decide to get complex all of a sudden? Well, there are a bunch of ideas floating around. One theory is that as more oxygen started filling up the atmosphere, it gave cells the energy boost they needed to get a bit more complicated. Another idea is that when big supercontinents like Rodinia broke up, it mixed up the ocean and made new homes for life to evolve in different ways. These early multicellular organisms were kind of like the trailblazers. They set the stage for all sorts of life, from plants to animals, and eventually us humans. It was a time of massive diversification. Life started figuring out new ways to eat, grow, and just be. In a nutshell, the Proterozoic Eon was like life's big experimental phase. The oceans were brimming with all these new forms of life, each trying out different ways to survive and thrive. And these Ediacaran creatures, they were the pioneers of this new, bustling underwater world. This era was a prelude to the Cambrian Explosion, which is when life really went wild in terms of diversity. So in a way, the Proterozoic Eon was when life on Earth started getting really interesting. It was a time of big changes and the start of a story that's still unfolding today. 
Let's hit the fast forward button and zoom to about 1.1 billion years ago. This is when Earth did something pretty wild. It pulled all its land together into one huge supercontinent called Rodinia. Imagine this, a massive stretch of land from one pole to the other, like Earth wearing a giant land belt. Now, Rodinia wasn't just a big chunk of land sitting there looking pretty. It shook things up big time. When all this land came together, it stirred the pot on a global scale, changing how the ocean moved, messing with the weather, and even tweaking the ocean's chemistry. The world was a very different place when Rodinia was around. Here's a brain bender. Some scientists think Rodinia might have been the culprit behind the snowball Earth events. The idea is that with Rodinia hogging all the land, Earth's natural heat blanket got all out of whack, leading to a massive deep freeze. We're talking about glaciers and ice covering pretty much everything, even places where you'd now go to catch some sun. It's like the whole planet turned into a giant snowball for millions of years. But life has a way of hanging in there. During these super chilly times, life might have found cozy spots near underwater volcanoes or in places where the ice didn't reach. It's like life always finds a little nook or cranny to survive. And these tough conditions, they might have been just the push life needed to get creative and evolve. The plot twist with Rodinia is that it didn't stick around forever. About 750 million years ago, it started breaking up, kind of like a band going their separate ways. This breakup was a big deal. It didn't just create new oceans and continents. It might have helped the Earth thaw out from its snowball state. The breakup changed how the oceans moved and how the air circulated, possibly warming things up again. Picture Earth way back in the Precambrian era. It's like the planet was having its wild teenage years with a serious passion for volcanoes. We're talking a time when Earth was basically a non-stop volcanic rock concert. Imagine hanging out on this young Earth. Everywhere you look, there are these epic volcanoes, seriously towering ones erupting like crazy. Lava and ash are painting the skies in all sorts of dramatic, fiery colors. This was the norm back then because Earth was way hotter under the hood. The planet's mantle was cooking, and with all that radioactive stuff going on inside, it meant a lot more heat, more melting rock, and you guessed it, more volcanoes. These weren't just any old volcanoes either. They were like the sculptors of Earth's surface. They spewed out lava and blew their tops in a way that kept making and remaking land. Think of it as Earth constantly redecorating its room. These massive eruptions were laying down the groundwork for future continents. But wait, there's more. This whole volcanic fiesta was also pumping out a bunch of gases. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, some sulfur stuff. All of which were super important in cooking up Earth's early atmosphere. And guess what? This had a big hand in shaping the planet's climate too. And here's the kicker. All this volcanic action was like a mineral factory. As the lava cooled down, it crystallized into minerals, leaving behind a treasure trove of stuff like copper and gold. That's right, the bling we dig up today. A lot of it started with these ancient volcanoes. Now let's dive underwater. These volcanoes were doing their thing beneath the ocean too, creating what we call hydrothermal vents. These hotspots might have been the cozy nurseries where life on Earth got its start, offering the right mix of energy and minerals for the first tiny organisms. Let's chat about Panotia, a supercontinent that's kind of like the enigma of Earth's history. Picture this, about 600 million years ago, Earth decides to pull a big move and squishes most of its land into this supercontinent called Panotia. But here's the catch. Panotia was like a shooting star in the grand timeline there for a brief but oh so important moment. Now Panotia was hanging out during the late Precambrian period and let me tell you Earth was really shaking things up back then. Panotia wasn't like the other supercontinents. It wasn't as big as its predecessor Rodinia and it didn't stick around for too long. But don't let that fool you. Panotia had some serious game. When Panotia came together it might have had a hand in ending one of Earth's chilliest times, the snowball Earth phase. Some think that when all these land masses snuggled up together, it messed with the oceans and the climate enough to start thawing Earth out of its icy shell. But the real action started when Panotia began to split up, only a few tens of millions of years after it formed. This breakup was like setting the stage for one of the most spectacular shows in Earth's history, the Cambrian Explosion. We're talking about an era where life just went wild with diversity. As Panotia broke apart, it made new continents and shallow seas. 
The perfect playground for all sorts of marine life to evolve and flourish, there's even a theory that the way Pinotia broke apart helped kickstart the evolution of complex multicellular life. It's like when the continents shifted and created new oceans, they also whipped up a bunch of new homes for life to evolve in different and exciting ways. And it wasn't just about life. Geologically speaking, Panotia's formation and breakup were kind of a big deal. They led to the creation of new mountain ranges and layers of rock that we're still studying today to piece together Earth's past. Plus, the breakup of Panotia laid down some serious mineral deposits, which we're pretty grateful for now. So, wrapping this up, Panosha might have been brief, but it was super important. It's a chapter in Earth's history that shows just how dynamic our planet is, always moving, always changing. It's like Earth is this giant puzzle, constantly rearranging itself. And Panotia was a key piece that helped shape everything from the climate and oceans to the evolution of life itself.